Okay, hello, so welcome to uh, lecture 5 of CSD 3205 and this, uh, in this lecture I'm going to be covering threads and how you can imp implement them in Java. So I'm going to start off by introducing you to threads, explaining how you can uh, write multi-threaded programs in Java. Then I'm going to explain how you can use synchronization um, to handle situations in which you've got multiple threads trying to access the same data structure. And then I'm going to very briefly show you how you can sort of bring it all together um, and build a multi-threaded web scraper. Now it's a thread, um, it's a very simple really, it's just a, a sequence of instructions that's executed on a single processor or processor core. And the key thing here with a thread is that the sequence is a, the, it's a deterministic sequence. So, you know, one, one instruction is executed, then a second one, and a second one, and the second one always comes after the first one, and the third one always after the second one. So one instruction is completed, and then the next instruction uh, is started, and so on and so forth. So if we look at the little bit of code that I sort of gave you last week, um, here we've got, you know, clock, creating a new clock, setting the time, maybe some exception handling here, and then we've got this sort of little loop here where we're ticking the clock, outputting some logging and stuff, ticking the clock out with some logging stuff. Now this is what would happen within a single thread. We're doing this thing, this thing, maybe with the exception handling, and then this thing. So one thing is executed after another. It's a deterministic sequence of instructions, um, and you can't, uh, do the ticking until you've actually set the time, you know, within this particular piece of code, yeah? What this thing has to come after this thing, which is sort of very convenient and easy to program. But um, we can uh, run multiple threads at the same time, and this is expressed by saying that the threads run concurrently. For example, one thread can run the graphics, um, another thread can carry out, you know, some other computer some other computationally demanding task. So if you have a I don't know if you've written des desktop applications in Java, but the problem you can have is that you, you've got your sort of main graphics thread, and then if you try and do something really complicated or heavy um, with the, within the graphics thread, um, such as you know accessing files or going to the database or whatever, um, then you'll find that your graphics thread just sort of freezes um, because there's only a single thread, it's got to do the computationally demanding task, and then it can return to do the you know event handling on the graphics. So what people typically do is they'll spin off a separate thread, that'll do the computationally demanding task, and then your graphical interface won't freeze like it's, like it's um, crashed, it will just uh, still remain responsive, but then you can pop up some kind of, you know, processing dialogue or something to tell the user what's happening. Threads are extremely useful um, when your program has blocking calls in it. So I don't know if you've done uh, socket programming in, in your first year, um, but if you're doing socket programming, you know, you typically, typically got to sort of open a connection and then wait for some data, and your entire program's going to freeze unless you han have that sort of waiting for data stuff in a, in a separate thread. In the context of this, uh, this year and this, this uh, course, um, we're typically going to use threads um, to wait for a server, because with web scraping, you're sending off your HTTP request, um, sending off HTTP requests to a server, that server could take 10 seconds to reply, right? So if you've got to scrape 100 websites and each of them takes 10 seconds, it's going to take an awful long time to sort of send off a request to one, wait for the response, send off a request to another, and all the time that you're waiting, your, your, your application is effectively frozen. So it's much better for this kind of application um, to use threads, um, a separate thread to deal with each of the separate servers, and that also enables you to sleep for this kind of cruel de delay stuff, as I'll explain later. And, you know, if you've got something complicated going on in the background, printing, file saving, whatever, again, you don't want to sort of wait, make the user sort of sit there, you know, well, with graphics frozen while, while the application goes off and does that. Much better to do it as a separate thread, and if something goes wrong, you know, you can always provide some kind of user message at the end of it. So, how threads are actually implement, uh, executed depends on their sort of hardware architecture, to some extent. So if you've got multiple CPUs and not many, not many threads, then the threads can actually run on these separate CPUs. So, in this is a situation in which you've got three threads, and this is like the execution time of the threads. And these three threads are running on three CPUs. Each CPU can basically give its all, all of its time, all of its processing time, to the thread that's sitting on it and so all the threads are running at the same time. On the other hand, in, uh, if you've only got a single CPU or more threads than the CPUs, then you do what's called time slicing, where the CPU will execute a little bit of thread one, a little bit of thread two, a little bit of thread three, and then it'll go back and execute a little bit of thread one, a little bit of thread two, and a little bit of thread three. 
Now, the amount of time that's given to each of these threads may vary um, depending on how busy the thread is, whether the thread's gone to sleep, and also you can set priority levels for threads. So if thread one was high priority, this might get lots of CPU time, and if thread three was low priority, it might get very little CPU time. This leads to a problem called starvation, which I'll cover in a little bit more detail in a few more slides. Anyway, this is called time slicing. So this is generally how a lot of threads are executed with the CPU hopping between the threads. <clears throat> it's doing this very fast, right? So it might be 10, 10 milliseconds each one. So it appears that all thread, three threads are running in parallel, but in fact, they're, um, they're not. Now in Java, we've got two options um, if you want to write, write multi-threaded programs. Two main, maybe there's other ones, but these are the two main ones. One way of doing this is to create a class that implements the runnable interface. And we pass this class to a Java thread, and then that executes that uh, the run method in, in our class as a separate thread, as I'll explain. The other option we got is we can extend the Java thread class and override the run method. So to explain the runnable interface, I think I need to say a little bit about what an interface is in Java. Um, I'm guessing you haven't been had that covered in uh, first year of Java, but just in case, or if you've forgotten, I'm just going to remind you now. So an interface um, is a definition of a set of behaviors um, that a class should exhibit, yeah? It's not an actual, there's no code that does anything in an interface. It just says, if you want to implement this interface, you have to, um, you have to uh, have this particular set of methods that's contained in the interface, so that, um, which is like a, like a set of behaviors kind of thing. So, so yeah, you say you, uh, maybe it's easier the example. Um, the key thing about interfaces is the class can implement multiple interfaces. And so in, in Java, you can only inherit from a single, for, you can only inherit from a single class, but you can implement multiple interfaces. So there may be situations in which you want uh, to implement um, several different sets of behaviors. Um, and so since you can't inherit from lots of different classes, um, you might want to do that using the interface mechanism. So let's give an example. It's probably much easier than an example. So here we have a, our inter calculator interface. So we to so initially um, we declare it using the interface um, keyword. So usually we'd have like public class, but in this case it's an interface. And then we got a bunch of methods: add number, clear, enter number, get results. But because it's an interface and not a class, we have no implementation of these methods. We're just ending this with a semicolon. They're just it's a pure you know, definition of how any class that behaves like this calculator um, should behave. You know, it's a definition of the behaviors of a calculator um, such that if we implement this interface, we have to have all these kind of methods, yeah? So they're just empty methods, um, but note that, you know, they're quite carefully defined. There's a void, return, you know, we've got, uh, you know, numbers and argument. Everything has to be right if we're going to implement this interface. And then here we've got a class that actually implements this interface. We've got this like my calculator implements calculator. So this is a class implementing this interface. And if we implement the calculator interface, we have to have all of the methods, all of these methods in our class. And if we're implementing, if it's a class, then these methods actually have to have uh, contents, right? They actually have to have functionality inside them. So, you know, we can have like uh, variables to maintain our entire state. And then each of these calculator methods, we actually have implementations of. And if we miss out one of these methods, it won't compile because it knows that calculator has to have all these methods. And so we can now, once we build our calculator, um, we can then, all another program has to know is that I'm implementing uh, the calculator interface and then it can just call these methods on my, on my class. And then it should just work, right? That's the point of it, yeah? So other classes can know that I'm implementing this particular interface and therefore they can call particular methods on my class. So the runnable interface is a lot simpler than the calculator example. It's just got a single method called run. And so to run a thread using the runnable interface, I create a class uh, that implements the runnable interface in just the way that my calculator implemented the calculator interface. And this must have a run method because that's the method that's defined within the runnable interface. And then we just pass the class to the Java thread. The Java thread, when it starts, um, will execute the code in the run method. So here's my class. Hello Runnable, implementing the Runnable interface. Um, the Runnable interface defines a single method public void run. And so I'm implementing Runnable, so I must have this run method in my Hello Runnable class. And all this is doing in this case is just printing out Hello from a thread. 
Now something to note about all sort of thread stuff is that it's only the code within the run method and you know methods or whatever that are called by the code within the run method that forms part of the separate thread. You know, you, your class might have 20 methods, none of those methods are called by the thread, um, only the stuff within the run method. And that run method might call in a method in your class and then that becomes part of the thread, but it has to be triggered or called by stuff within the run method. Only the run method is the separate thread. Yeah, I got very confused about this when I started doing threads, um, so yeah, it's important to be clear about it, yeah? So to execute the runnable class, it's sort of kind of easy, right? We just create our class here. Then we create a thread. This is a bog standard, you know, um, Java thread. And we pass in our uh, class that implements the runnable interface here. And then we call thread.start. And because we've passed in our runnable class with the run method, when we call thread.start, it will execute this run method um, within a separate thread. You know, doing whatever magic uh, Java does in the background to make that happen. So that's um, the runnable interface. The other way of making th uh, running threads in Java is to extend um, the thread class. And when you extend a class, again, I don't know how much inheritance you did um, previous year, but just to refresh that. So in extend a class, you inherit all of the protected and public methods and variables of that class. So it's a very standard way of doing certain kinds of functionality. I used to use it loads when I was building graphical interfaces in Java. So you inherit all the public protected and public methods and variables of that class. So within your class that extends another class, um, you can access everything that's public and protected. You can't access the private stuff that remains wrapped up inside the um, class you're inheriting from. You could also create your own implementation of the class's methods, and this is called overriding the methods. So if the class has, you know, some kind of protected, you know, method of some kind, um, you can just call that method if you want but you can also write your own version of that method. And when that method is called on your class, um, it's your version of it that will be called, not the original one um, in the class that you're inheriting from. So Thread has a whole ton of complex functionality, most of which I'm ignorant of, um, but we can, ex to make our own multi-threaded program, we can just create our, our own class that extends the thread. So when we extend thread, we get all of that complex stuff within Java thread. We can access all the public and protected stuff of that thread, and we can override some of the thread methods. So we don't have to do anything here, right? We could just skip the run, and it, if we called run, if we started up the thread, it would do whatever it did, probably throw an exception because we haven't um, uh, overridden the run method. Um, but here we're overriding the run method. So when the thread starts up, it will execute um, what's in R the run method we've written, not the original run method of the thread. In this case, it's just saying hello from thread, nothing fancy. So this is how it works. So here is our hello thread. We're creating a new instance of it, and we're calling hello thread.start. So we haven't written this start method. It doesn't exist anywhere in our code, but we get that from the thread method here. And when we call start, um, the thread will look for its run method or our, our overridden or the overridden version of it, and then it will start it up running as a separate thread. So you've got these two choices, um, and why should you choose one or the other? Well, in Java, you can only extend or inherit from a single class. So, uh, so you, it might, is somewhat unlikely, I'm not sure your architecture would be particularly good if you were in this situation, but you might be in a situation in which you're extending one class because of some functionality you actually have to, absolutely have to have, but you want to make it multi-threaded in some way. So in that case, um, maybe the interface approach would make the most sense because you could still uh, run your, parts of your code as a separate thread, but you could and then but continue to inherit from a different class that wasn't a thread. Um, so yeah, if your class is already derived from another class, you might uh, have to implement runnable. But personally, I think um, extending thread is easier. And mostly, you know, it's sort of conceptually simpler. You've got your class that has all the threaded stuff in it and extends thread. And it's sort of easier to start and think about and deal with. So personally, I prefer extending thread, but you're welcome to extend implement runnable if, if, you, if that makes more sense in what you're doing. Now, before I go on to sort of demonstrate um, how th sort of actually show you some examples of threads running, um, and it's probably worth introducing the sleep method. So this is a thread method, method that pauses execution. And whenever you're writing threads, um, you'll find it very useful to send them to sleep from time to time. You know, of course, there's situations where you're, you know, doing the computationally demanding task and then you're not going to be sleeping your threads. But in the case of any kind of networking or web stuff, you're often sort of doing something, sleeping for a bit, doing something else, sleeping for a bit, whatever. 
I used to sleep a lot when I was writing my sort of music system where you had to sort of sleep between, you know, sending out the notes, this kind of stuff, yeah? The sleep method um, has this long, you specify how long it wants to sleep, and all it does is pauses the thread. It'll do nothing for as long as it's sleeping. Now, the, tri the tricky thing about sleep, if you need, if you want this to be a precise uh, value, um, is that the sleep time doesn't always exactly match um, the value here. So, with you know your desktop or laptop, or whatever, it's not a real-time operating system. So the, your, your operating system is doing all kinds of things, and if it's busy, um, it'll sort of check your thread, see if it's past the sleep time or not. If it's not, it'll ignore it again, sort of do the time slicing thing. But if it if it and then it'll come back to it at some future point in time, which might be after a thousand milliseconds, right? So say you say you want say you specify you want your thread to sleep for a thousand milliseconds. Um, then by the operating system might come back to that thread like 1,100 milliseconds after it had gone to sleep and then wake it up again. So the sleep time might not exactly match um, what you specify here, but it'll typically be longer than what you specify there. Now, um, sleep will throw an interrupted exception. That means you can actually wake it up from sleep if you want to with another thread. Um, so you need to do try and catch when using sleep, and I'll explain all this in a little bit. So this is our run method now. I've done a little bit, this has got a bit more content to it, so you know, can actually do some demos. So here we've got just a little for loop. It's printing hello from thread. And as I said, this sleep will throw an interrupted exception if another thread interrupts it. So here we're sending the thread to sleep for a thousand milliseconds. If it's not interrupted, it'll go back up to here and do like five. So all we're expecting here is it's gonna do five, like hello from threads, um, plus the counter here. So that's a very simple thread that would just sort of, you know, output hello from thread five times with a thousand milliseconds interval between them. Now, if we want to run multiple threads, which is what we typically want to do, um, we do this by creating multiple instances of the thread class and running them simultaneously. So this is an important point here. We can't create one instance of a thread class and call start on it lots of times. Um, it doesn't work. Yeah, you'll throw some kind of an exception. Um, you have to have separate classes um, if you want to run multiple threads. So here's my multiple thread example. I think we're getting close to being able to demo some of this stuff. So what I've got here is an ID just to sort of make it all clear. So when we create the thread, we pass in a particular ID. And then when we say, when we say hello from thread, we're saying hello from a particular thread with that particular ID, yeah? So it's exactly the same as the previous example, except I put in the ID thing so we can see that we have multiple different threads, yeah? And then here's the main method here. So we're creating two separate threads, thread classes, sorry, two separate instances. It's the same class but two instances of this class, and then we're starting them both up. As I said, you can't, I couldn't do hello thread one dot start twice. I have to have two separate instances of the class and start them up separately, and then they'll run as separate threads. And so we do this, um, what we get as the output is, you know, hello from thread one. Now note that there's a, because they're, you know, at the, you know, subject to the vagaries, whims of the operating system, um, there's no sort of deterministic sequence in which uh, which one's sort of outputting its output first. So, you know, firstly, thread one outputs, hello from thread one, then we get a couple of two, thread two outputs its, you know, hello from thread stuff a couple of times, then thread one, and then we get mixed up again. With threads, you don't have, when you've got two threads running simultaneously in parallel, there's no sort of deterministic sequence in terms of what happens in one thread compared to another thread. Unless you're going to synchronize them explicitly, the threads just run off and do their own thing, and that will typically be semi-desynchronized. Let's have a demo then. So all this code, as usual, is available on the class website. So this is my hello thread, I think it is. So right, yeah. So here we got our code with our two threads. Let's run that. Um, and so we've got hello third one, sort of, you know, um, so kind of what I, what I showed you, right? So it does that five times. If we could look at hello thread, is that the one? Yes, that's the one. So all it's doing is each thread is outputting that, sleeping for a little bit, outputting that, sleeping for a little bit, and does that five times, and that's it. And as I said, you don't have this deterministic sequence in the order in which they're, you know, up in, so one thread's doing that, and then the order, the 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 order between this operation in one thread and this operation in another thread is non-deterministic. Right, okay. 
So when you're doing threads, threads, the thread class has uh, some several other useful useful methods. So is alive will tell us whether a thread has been started up and the run method is active, and it's got code executing in the run method. Join, I'll use this a little bit later, but sometimes you're going to have one up one one thread, uh, the main application thread typically, it's going to start up some other threads, they're going to do some useful work, and then it's when you shut the thing down, for example, or under some other situations, you might want to wait for other threads to finish before you sort of close the application or do something else. So join, if you call join on a thread, that join will block um, until on the thread that calls it until uh, the other thread finishes execution. Interrupt means you can sort of break, if the, sleep, the thread's gone to sleep and you want to wake it up, you can call interrupt on it and that will break it out of sleep. Uh, yield, I'm going to mention this in terms of starvation, but you can pause, that will give other, th so if you've got a high priority thread, you might want to yield so that other lower priority threads can have a chance to execute, and I'll explain that in a little bit more, a little bit later. So, I've explained how we start threads, um, next I'm going to explain how we stop threads. So you often want to stop the execution of threads. It's something you always, you know, build into them typically. So in the case of this web scraping, we might want to cleanly shut down our application. There's probably again more than two approaches, but these are sort of two that are common and I'm most aware of. This is the one I kind of prefer because it's sort of conceptually simple. We just implement our own stop method. But thread has these kind of built-in methods for shutting down threads, and you know, maybe that's a better choice, I don't know. So stop methods sort of dead easy. We just add a boolean to our thread class, get our insider for the boolean. I uh, use run thread. Doesn't really matter what it's called as long as it's not called something that um, conflicts with the existing stuff in thread. Um, and then we just periodically check the boolean and exit if it's false. So this is a typical way in which I'd sort of implement this. So we've got our boolean run thread here. When we start running within the run method, then this is the bit that it operates as a separate thread. We set run thread to true. Then, because we want the thread to run indefinitely until we shut it down, or we can always add some other conditions here, but usually we're just going to run that thread forever. So we, while the run thread equals true, um, it's going to do whatever's in this loop. So this is the main stuff that goes on with the thread. Okay. In this case, all it's doing is thread is running, and then it'll try and go to sleep. And if it's got some exception or whatever, set run thread to be false, and then break out its one loop, this while loop. So it'll even handle being interrupted. Um, and so just keep on doing this forever until a, a different thread somewhere else in the application will call stop thread here. That'll set run thread to false. Um, and then that'll break it out of this one loop, this while loop, and then exit the uh, run method and the thread will shut down. So as I'll explain later, this should probably be a volatile um, variable, but I'll explain what that means later, but it'll work, this, this actually works just fine. So if you want to run this, we just create a new thread uh, have I got any, yeah, so create, new th create the new version of that thread, we start it up, the run method gets going, we execute everything in here, and then all I've got here is it's just reading in um, input from the user, um, and when the user types stop, so it'll keep reading in user input, this will get sort of trapped in this kind of while loop here, keep reading in stuff from the user, when I, the user types stop, we'll get onto this part of the code here, so the thread will start, It'll, the, this main, the, the, the main application thread will sort of get hung up in here. It'll, it'll get caught up in here until the user type stop. When the user type stop, we'll move on to the final bit when it calls stop thread. Stop thread will set that boolean to false, and, it'll, and then the thread will execute, exit, and shut down. Uh, but, 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 yeah, it'll call call that. So the call stop thread there. That'll set run thread to false, and ex, and it break out of this while loop here. All right, well, let's do a demo then. So let's have a see what, oh, come on. So I've got a stop thread here. It's rather annoyingly, I'm gonna just get rid of this. Uh, oh, okay, so let's just uh, close that down. Here's my stop thread here. All right, so this is exactly what I showed you, right? We've got like run threads true, blah, 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 blah. If we've got a stop thread main, we've got the same thing. So let's just run that. Okay, so we've got thread is running. So this thread doesn't have any way of stopping, right? It's just going to keep running on forever until I call I change run thread to false. I could probably do that in debugger if I was feeling clever. But what I can do, I've got this listening now. If I just type in stop, um, then it will 
get past this piece of the code that's looking for stop being typed into the command line, into the output, and then it'll call stop thread and set the boolean to false and, and then job done. So advantages and disadvantages stop. So it's easy. Um, if you've got your own little boolean that you're fiddling around with, um, it's easier to ensure that the thread completes its required tasks. Um, but what won't, what's, what this method will not handle um, is the sleep. So if your thread is going to sleep for long periods, um, then this is not going to work very well, right? Because you're going to, um, it's not going to check that boolean until it wakes up from sleep. So if you're checking, if you're waking up from sleep every 500 milliseconds, then you're going to be able to easily shut down your application by in, the approach, in this approach, because it'll break out of the sleep, check the boolean, and then you can just shut down very quickly. But if you've got long sleeping, doing a lot of sleeping in your application, um, then uh, you know, you're going to need some other method to wake it up from sleep so that you can shut it down without waiting you know, for it to finish sleeping. So the other way to go about this is to do what's called interrupting threads. You call the interrupt method on the thread, and we'll call some methods to throw an interrupted exception. So if the thread has gone to sleep and it's in a long sleep, um, you know, such that this actually happens. Um, if you call interrupt on that thread, you'll wake it up from sleep, throw an exception, and as long as you've got some way of handling that exception, that's one way in which you can uh, start to use to shut down the thread. And you can also, if it's not asleep, um, you can check this, you call this static method thread interrupted, which checks to see if the thread um, has been interrupted. Um, and that will actually reset the interrupt after it's been checked. So it'll return true or false and then reset the interrupt to false, presumably. But you can also do it in a non-static way by is interrupted, um, which doesn't change the status of the interrupt flag. So there's just different ways in which you can check the same thing depending on how you want to build your application. So here's my little example. So instead of uh, having my own boolean, I'm checking to see if the thread has been interrupted. So it'll do this for as long as the thread has not been interrupted. But what, what if the functionality that I'm getting here that's different from what I had before is that if I'm asleep here, so the try catch is outside of the while loop, yeah? If I sleep here um, and call interrupt on this thread, um, then it'll call, throw an exception and I'll end up here and then I'll um, end up exiting the run method. And maybe I could wrap, I could put the try catch around here still if I wanted, but you know, it doesn't really matter. Depends what you're trying to do, right? So, um, Slightly different way, except it has the benefit of waking up from sleep. So this is exactly the same code. Um, create the new interrupt thread. We start it up. And when I type stop, instead of calling, when I type stop, that will get me out of this piece of code here. I'll end up here. Call interrupt. And that's going to throw the exception if it's asleep. Otherwise, it's going to um, just change, this, change the, that this is uh, false instead of true. True instead of false, right? Well, it's not interrupted. Yeah, so it'll change it to true um, when I call interrupt if it's not asleep. Otherwise, it causes the exception to be thrown. And so it works in exactly the same way. So let's just quickly... Uh, uh, bah, 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 bah. Here's my interrupt thread. So exactly the same way. Okay. So in this case, I've got a long uh, long sleep. So if I just type stop, um, it's interrupted during sleep. Because here I put it on a long sleep just to make it obvious that it's working. So it's got like a 10 second sleep time. So it just sort of sits there forever, and I can't interrupt it using by changing any kind of boolean, but I can interrupt it by causing it to throw this interrupted exception, which causes it to go here, and then it just gets this thread interrupted during sleep message. So when we stop our threads, as I said, it's sometimes useful to wait for the threads to complete um, before we close down everything, everything else. And the way in which we can uh, do that is to use the join method. So if I call join on a thread, it will block um, because you're calling join within another thread. So we've got two threads. One thread sort of interrupts the other thread. Let's say thread A interrupts thread B, right? It was, and it wants to wait for thread B to finish. So it calls join on thread B. That will block thread A until thread B is also finished. Yeah, so we've got my thread, new, my thread. We start at my thread, interrupt my thread, and my thread dot join will mean that this program that's executing this code, um, this thread that's executing this code, will wait, nothing, it won't move on to the next ex instruction here until it's actually, until, um, until my thread is finished. Now, thread priority. So threads all have a different, well, unless you, 
you know, they probably all have the same priority level unless you actually set the priority level, but threads do have a priority level which can be used um, to select which thread to run. So I'm pretty sure one presumably is top priority and 10's lowest priority, but it might be worth checking that if you're going to mess around with stuff. So the Java Virtual Machine will run the thread with the highest priority until that thread sort of sleeps or yields or something like that. So then you can kind of get priority of the thread and set the priority. So you might have some kind of time critical part of your program um, that you want to have high priority. So for example, when I was doing my music system, I'd want my the stuff that actually played the music to be working as close to real time as possible, whereas maybe the graphics would be like a lower priority thread. But the, if you're messing around with priorities, um, generally that's fine. Um, but you may have this problem that if you've got several, one or more high, high priority threads that are doing lots of stuff, then they're going to get all the CPU time, and the threads with low priority might not get any CPU time, right? Particularly if you've got a limited number of cores, or very few cores. Um, so if the high priority thread doesn't yield or sleep, the low priority threads might never get any action, so to speak. Um, and um, th this leads to starvation of the other threads, which means that they, they're not doing anything at all, and they're just sort of sitting there in a quiescent state without actually doing any instructions. So if that's a problem, it might not be a problem, um, but it might. if it is a problem, then you need to use sleep or yield on the high priority threads um, to, to enable them to sort of instruct the virtual machine to you know, ex give a bit of CPU time to the lower priority threads. Okay, so hopefully that's given you enough um, to get started with threads. Um, so I've shown you how to start threads, and I've shown you how to stop them, and I've shown you where the code goes um, that's going to be multi-threaded, right? Now it comes to a sort of slightly difficult topic, but I think I need to cover it um, because you can often have this problem um, when you're running multiple threads. So you have, you know, the problem with uh, threads is they're it's like two people, right? If you've got two people doing their own thing. Um, they're not synchronized in any way. Um, so these two threads, if they're working on the same data structure at the same time, they can end up corrupting the data structure or getting very confused in what they're doing to that data structure. So if you, without synchronization, two threads can just conflict or, you know, they've got no, they need to be coordinated if they want to do something sensible um, when they're working on the same data structure at the same time. Otherwise you can get the data in an inconsistent state. So to prevent these kinds of problems, um, Java has mechanisms that prevent multiple threads from accessing data structures simultaneously. So if you don't want two threads to be, you know, messing with the same thing at the same time, um, there's, there's some nice ways of preventing that in Java. There's sort of synchronized methods is one approach, synchronized statements, and locks, and I'll try and explain um, each of these. So synchronized methods are probably, you know, the most straightforward one. All we do is we add the keyword synchronized to a particular method. So if we've got a method here, so public void increment, to make that a synchronized method, we just put the synchronized um, keyword in here. And once we put that in, um, the Java Virtual Machine will follow the rule that two threads cannot invoke the same synchronized method on the same object simultaneously. So for all of this um, locking and synchronization mechanisms, um, the key thing is the object on which they're synchronized. So if we've got a synchronized so we've got object A with synchronized method increment and object B with synchronized method increment. Um, the two threads can do whatever they like um, with if, if one thread is interacting with object A, another thread is interacting with object B, then there'll be no problems. The synchronization only comes in if both thread if the two threads are trying to call the same synchronized method um, on the same object, or possibly any synchronized method on the same object. So suppose thread A is executing a synchronized method on object A. If thread B tries to execute a synchronized method on object A, it will block until thread A has finished. So you can't execute the synchronized method on object B without being blocked, yeah? Oh, it can execute, sorry, the, that's what I was trying to explain. Yeah, it can execute the synchronized method on object B. So the synchronization is relative to a particular object. That's the point I'm trying to make. So I'm gonna give you a few examples here um, to show you, you know, how synchronization can work. Um, so I've got a class here called counter. This is, and so we're going to use an instance of this class that's shared um, between a couple of threads, yeah? And I've got here um, a, a non-synchronized method, um, and all this method is doing is, incre all these methods are doing increasing the counter by a large amount, right? It's just working through from i equals all, i is less than 100 million, and then it's just increasing the count. So it's increasing this variable here, and then returning the variable that's been increased. 
So we've got a non-synchronized version of that method, and then we've got a synchronized version of that method. And I said, well, with the synchronized thing, all we're doing is using a synchronized keyword here. So and, here, so, and then we got the non-synchronized thread that's calling a non-synchronized method, so it's completely standard. So this is this class is shared between the threads here, because when we create the class, we're passing in this counter class, an instance of this counter class, as well as an ID, so we, we just know what the threads, which thread it is. So the constructor of the class, um, we pass in the counter, we're going to pass the same counter into two threads here, and then the run method, it's just doing calling counter big increase. So it's calling this method here, so it's going to increase the count here. So we're going to have two threads, they're calling this method at the same time, and increasing count at the same time on the same class, right? So it's going to create problems, which is deliberate, right? Um, so we're creating an instance of these classes, passing in this counter object, this counter here, so a single counter, passing into both threads, and then we're th starting both threads, and both threads are going to call this method here to increase this value here. Okay, I hope that's clear. Now, if we look at the output from this, um, we do first run, whatever, we're getting the output here, the so the first one has like the, the counter method returns, you know, a bit under, one, two, three, four, six, a bit under 100 million, slightly over 100 million. I think this is due to the implementation of, uh, you know, when you break it, you know, it shouldn't be less than 100 million, but it is, but that's something to do with the implementation of um, the sort of return method and, yeah, it's, stuff like that, doesn't really matter. The point is, um, we've got different runs, and on di each different run, we're getting a different result, yeah. That's the that's the crucial point I'm trying to make here. So here we have like 100 million, blah, 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 100 million, 888,478. Uh, so we're not getting anything consistent. We're not getting consistent results between the two threads. We might want that, that's fine, but most of the time we don't want this kind of, this kind of result. There's a little demo. Okay, so... Here we've got our, so that's our synchronized, this is close to some things, so it's going to be confusing. Okay, so that's our synchronized method, and so in the thread, that's it, yeah, okay, so this is like the non-synchronized version. So the thread is calling counter big increase, um, and then just outputting that, the results from that, and let's just run that. Ugh, go on, right. Uh, here. Okay, so non-synchronized counter we get, you know, whatever, um, as, and, so we get 100, 913, uh, 919, and then we we'll do it again, we get 102 million, you know, 690,000, so you can see we're getting completely different numbers, as I said, the thing of being less than a thousand, so less than 100 million, doesn't quite make sense, um, except it's probably something to do with how we're returning this value while it's being, so it's increasing it, um, and it's, it's probably copying it somewhere or other when it's returning it, and during the copying process it's being increased by the other one. Doesn't really matter anyway, so. The point is, we're getting inconsistent results. So, we can avoid that problem um, by using these synchronization methods, right? So we can do counter synchronize big increase. We can call this method instead of this method. All that's different, as you can see, is we've just got synchronized here instead of um, just nothing here, yeah? Now, when we do synchronized, it, and since we're using the same counter class, both threads are showing the same counter class, um, the first thread that calls this method will gain exclusive access um, to the synchronized stuff on that class, yeah? So the second thread won't be able to call this method until the first thread has finished it. With it. That's the idea. So one thread gets the exclusive access to that object, gets the result, and then it releases its access to the object, and the second thread can get access to that object and call that method and get, call that method and get its result, yeah? So if we run the synchronized output, run the synchronized counter, we're getting like nice result, like one million. So one thread's increasing it by a hundred million, then the next thread's increasing it by a hundred million, and that happens every single time. So we're not getting this problem of the inconsistent data structures. So I might as well give a little demo for that. Um, synchronize. Oh yeah, I just have to change this, don't I? So I can just um... okay. So if we run the synchronized version. Um... Uh, everything's the same, except I'm calling the synchronized version, yeah? So we're getting 1 million, 100 million, 200 million. If we run that a couple of times, we get exactly the same right timing result each time.
so the full the sort of proper way so we can eat with synchronization you can um, just sort of bung in these synchronized keywords and make sure that you know and that that will probably make it work uh, most of the time if you're sharing calling the synchronized stuff calling synchronized methods on the same object but it's better if you sort of have a little bit of a deeper understanding of this and then you can make it work for you in the way that you need it to work yeah so the whole Java synchronization method is based on this internal entity called an intrinsic lock or monitor lock, okay? And so every object has a lock associated with it. So what happens when you're getting exclusive access to an object is that you're acquiring the object's lock. And once you've got that lock, no other thread can acquire the same lock. Um, and the lock gives you access to all the sort of synchronized stuff that happens within an object. It doesn't matter about the non-synchronized stuff. Uh, there might be non-synchronized methods that are perfectly thread safe, but by using the synchronized keywords in combination with this lock, um, then you can control, um, you know, you can prevent multiple threads from executing the synchronized stuff at the same time. So non-synchronized, doesn't matter. Synch everything's synchronized with the objects. You need to acquire the object's lock in order to execute the synchronized stuff. Until the thread releases that lock, no other thread can, can call the synchronized methods. Yep, so I think it's clear, I hope. Um, and so synchronized statements work in a more, exp uh, sort of take that notion of a lock and make it a little bit more explicit than synchronized methods. So it provides it and also has the advantage that a slightly more fine-grained way of synchronizing threads. So there are blocks of code that are synchronized on a particular object. And so only one object, only sorry, one thread can access the synchronized block of code at a time. So, so it sort of makes this kind of explicit. What I just explained about synchronized locks and objects is sort of, you know, applies here. So here we've got that same big increase uh, method here, but instead of saying synchronized here, I've actually got a synchronized block of code in here. And this is where it becomes more flexible. And that's why I sort of wanted to explain the lock stuff just a little bit. Um, it's here I'm actually synchronizing this block of code on this, which is this whole sort of synchronized statement counter. So if multiple threads have access to the same class, um, then only one thread at a time can access this, um, this block of code here, because only one thread at a time can access the lock associated with this particular, an instance of this particular class. And then within that synchronized block of code, we've got the, you know, all that stuff. And we're synchronizing in this case on the object itself, but this is where it becomes flexible because we've got to actually synchronize it on a completely separate object um, that has nothing to do with the object itself. So in this case, um, I've got the same block of code within my big increase thing, but in this case, I'm synchronizing on um, a particular, just a plain old, you know, very simple Java object, has no functionality. Um, so I'm lock, in this case, lock is uh, this particular instance of this object here. And so you can see that maybe you want to pass the locker, the object's locks around or, you know, stuff like that, but it doesn't have to be the object itself. It can be any object at all. And so when we try one, one thread calls synchronized here, it'll acquire the lock on this object until it finishes this code and releases that lock, no other uh, thread will be able to access this bit of code. And this could be, even be a static thing, right? Um, and if you want to do this uh, in, a, in an even more sort of explicit way, you can actually use this lock interface um, implemented by the reentrant lock class. So this sort of takes this locking to sort of another level. We have a sort of method, these methods that Java makes available for lock management. So we can acquire the lock with the lock method, unlock, is locked, and try lock and stuff like that. Yeah. So in this case, instead of having synchronize, it's pretty much the same as synchronize, right? When we call lock dot lock, we're acquiring our exclusive access. Um, to the code within the space of the lock.lock .lock and the lock.unlock. So everything between lock.lock .lock and lock.unlock um, is then synchronized on that particular lock object. Yeah, I mean, a different lock, um, different bit of code with a different lock obviously could execute um, if we passed in the lock explicitly or something. Um, but in this case, we're just acquiring um, a lock on this particular object. Then we can carry the task and then unlock it. So it's very similar to the synchronized statement stuff. So a couple of other things I want to cover just before we sort of finish the, you know, thread stuff. Um, one of these is atomic actions. So many programming act tasks take several steps, yeah? So like if we do plus plus i, it's actually not an atomic action because you're sort of increasing, I think that returns the value of i before it was increased or something like that, I can't remember 
was it I plus plus, whichever way around. Um, anyway, it's not atomic action because you're increasing it and then returning a variable. Uh, I think it's the value of the variable before it was increased. Um, maybe it's the value after in this case. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's, it's not a single atomic action in which it's changing the value of one variable. It's actually a more complicated thing than that. Whereas atomic actions, um, it just doesn't have any internal steps. It's just one line of assembler code if we were working in C++ or one line of, you know, whatever the virtual machine processing. Um, so read and write for most virtual, most primitive variables um, is an atomic action. Um, long and double, a bit more complicated because they're handled in a slightly different way. So if we're doing atomic actions, um, then they're generally thread safe, right? Because one thread will do the atomic action, maybe the other thread will reverse it, but they're not going to, one thread's not going to do half of an atomic action because there's no such thing, yeah? But still, um, so we can share, that's why I had this run thread boolean, right? That we could share between threads and use, and one thread could use it to stop another thread from running because changing uh, run thread from true to false is an atomic action. So it's fairly set thread safe, but to, just to make sure it's super th thread safe, and we can use this volatile keyword. Because sometimes the Java virtual machine might make some optimization strategies um, that will mean that you know, the, the new value of a variable wouldn't appear simultaneously in all the threads. Um, but if we use the volatile keyword, um, then we can specify that this is kind of variable um, that you know, uh, is potentially shared between threads. Um, and therefore, you know, we're we're confident that all the threads can see the same value of the variable. So, in the case of run thread, it's worth making it volatile so that we're sure um, that one thread can effectively stop another without any kind of massive time delay or something. Another issue you get with threads is deadlock. Um, so, I've shown you all these nice and elegant locking and synchronization mechanisms. Um, with deadlock, you can end up with uh, two threads blocked forever waiting for each other. So your synchronization gets too good, effectively, yeah? So maybe thread A has the exclusive access to object A and is waiting for object B, whereas thread B has object B and is waiting for object A, yeah? Tried to get an example running, but, you know, it proved to be rather complicated, um, but it's something to watch out for in your projects. You know, particularly maybe with networking stuff, you know, you could easily end up with this kind of situation. So with deadlock, basically your program freezes because the two, two, two threads are waiting for things that they each that they, you know, they they got this dependency relationship and they're both waiting for each other, and and neither you know can break out of that. So just something to be aware of, really. And if you're getting a lot of crashes and freezes, um, this might be the issue behind it. Now collections. Um, so we can use all these locking mechanisms that I explained um, to handle the problem of ac accessing the same collection from multiple threads. That's fine. If we only access the, ca the, th the collections from within synchronized blocks of code, then we'll be okay. Um, but uh, we can also, there's also a sort of synchronized collection mechanism for enable us to uh, prevent multiple threads from messing up collections in a complicated way. Um, there are collections that are already synchronized. And we can also wrap existing collections within synchronization wrappers. So I wouldn't, don't worry too much about the details of this, because in your code, you're almost certainly going to be using um, Hibernate, which is fairly thread safe, I think. But um, we will you know, discuss that in, in the lecture on Hibernate. But if you do need to access collections from multiple threads, you could look into these kind of synchronization wrappers or these synchronized collections. And you know, so you basically create a synchronized list, for example, from a standard list. And then you can kind of iterate you know, over the... Um, so that's synchronized collection. Yeah, so it's a collection. Then you, you, it's basically, it's very similar to the synchronized statement, right? You're synchronizing on this particular, on this collection. It's a bit like applying that collection's lock, I suppose. And then you work through that collection um, in a thread safe way. Okay, so I've explained, you know, some of the, you know, slightly gory details of threads, but I think I've also explained, you know, the basics as well. And now in this like last little section, I'm going to explain how you can use the basics. You don't need to worry too much about synchronization, I think, but you may need to. That's why I've given you the stuff. Um, so I'm going to explain how you can just build a very simple multi-threaded web scraper, which is kind of all I'm expecting you to do for your projects. So threads make a great deal of sense um, when you're doing web scraping, right? Because we're sending an HTTP request to a server and waiting for a reply. Now, if, you, if we were a big price comparison or property search website, we might be pinging those servers, you know, maybe we might be pinging, you know, 100 servers or even 1,000 servers, right? And so the scraping would be super inefficient 
If each time you sent an uh, HTTP request to a server, you had to wait for the reply before sending the request to the next server, right? One server, if one server, say you have like an enormous bit of code and you'd be sort of working through each of the servers, um, and if one server was broken or down or something, then your code would just fall over and die, yeah? So it's much, much better um, if you can use multiple threads to scrape multiple websites. Also, uh, many websites have a crawl delay in their robots text file, and that's the interval between HTTP requests in seconds. It's not necessarily mandatory, but it's the sort of polite request that you don't hammer their website with lots of HTTP requests. So again, if we've got threads, we can just sleep for the specified amount between requests. So here, you know, the crawl delay or whatever, and this is a value in seconds that you're supposed to wait between HTTP requests when you're, when you're, uh, when you're scraping. So just to show you how a multi-threaded web scraping application could be organized, I put together this very simple example. So generally you're going to use a specialized class to crawl each website, yeah? And we could use kind of clever inheritance to do all this, but I haven't done this example. Um, because you're going to need, not only you're going to have to have special select statements, but you're going to have to have different URL handlings and so on and so forth. So probably you're going to write a different class for each website. Specialized class in this case extends thread, but you could, if you had some functionality that was common to all of your web scrapers, <coughs> then you could extend your own class, which extends thread or, do, or use the runnable interface or something. And um, importantly, I've added the functionality. We, we want to be able to shut the threads down cleanly by typing stop, or if you had a graphical interface, you could just click on a button or something. Um, because we don't, you could be in the middle of uh, storing stuff to the database. You don't want to just press stop in your IDE. Um, you know, because uh, otherwise you might get data in an inconsistent state in your database. So I don't know how much detail I'll go into this. So anyway, we've got our crawl delay here. And so I made this volatile, this run thread thing. I just kind of like this run thread stuff, but it's not necessarily the best approach. And so here is our run method. So I'm not giving, I'm not telling you how to write a web scraper. I'm just telling you how to organize it in a multi-threaded way. Yeah? So here's our run thread. Here's our while method. This is sort of the guts of the thing. I'm just printing out, scraping data. If you were doing web scraping, all of your web scraping code goes here, or you could just call a method that does the web scraping, and that method that does web scraping would then would still be executed um, within the separate thread because that call to the separate method that does the web scraping is within this run method here. So we're outputting what we're doing. You're going to write the web scraping code, and then it's sleeping for a little bit, which is like the crawl delays in seconds, so we're multiplying that by a thousand here. And then we're catching the interrupts here. I should actually put uh, run thread equals false here, but I forgot. Um, okay, so that's the, the threading bit. Dead easy, right? And then here's the main method. So all we're doing is creating our two scrapers and set the different classes, starting them up. I'm doing exactly what I did in the early example, that I'm just sort of uh, waiting for the user to type stop. So it'll hang my main thread. The thread of the main method um, will just hang here until I type in stop. When this, when I do type in stop, um, it'll call stop thread on the two threads, and so they'll break out the while method once they finish sleeping and all that. So I'm waiting for them to finish here. So I've nice, got a nice clean shutdown. So I'm joining, which means I'm waiting for these two threads to finish, and then when they're finished, I'll um, I just start putting web scraping complete. So final demo here. Uh, so here's my web scraper. So here's my main. And then my two scrapers. So these will be specialized classes written for, you know, for your particular websites. So if we run this here, so we've got third one scraping data. So the scraping data, I think I've got slightly different crawl delays on them. Is that right? Scraper one's got a crawl delay of uh, one and scraper two has a crawl delay of two. So that's why they've got, you know, this pattern here. And if I type in stop and then wait for them to stop that, wait for them to exit their sleep methods and web scraping complete. So it's a nice clean shutdown, which is which is really important. So there's uh, five marks for using two or more threads in your coursework. It's pretty obvious. Um, all of the example code I've shown you in this lecture is available on the course website. Um, if you're stuck with threads, I'm pretty confident that uh, chapter 30 goes into all the multi-threading stuff and we'll probably have a Q&A session to sort of talk you through it and some lab exercises as well. So this lecture explains how you can use threads in Java, and the next lecture I'm going to explain Maven.